السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ما شاء الله تبارك الله brilliant to see you guys once again and this evening we're going to be speaking to one of my good friends Dr. TK Harris who is our mental wealth guide that's what I'd like to call him ما شاء الله تبارك الله I hope my voice is clear and inshallah we will be speaking we have in the past spoken about mental wealth and I have uh, discussed so many uh, you know topics with him but at the same time I have um, uh, today chosen to speak about some of his books that he has uh, authored it's very beneficial mashallah tabarakallah and we're just waiting for him to come on what happened is he spoke to us the last time about mental health and he called it mental wealth the idea was to marry what medicine has taught with what Islam has taught and to strike the balance between the two. So Alhamdulillah, if he requests to join us, we would be able to, inshallah, Azza wa Jal, uh, join him by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here goes, Bismillah. And we take it from there, inshallah, Azza wa Jal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam, uh, Mufti. Mufti, what a wonderful uh, thing. It's been too long since we've done one of these. <laughs> it has that been. is very, very true. It has been very long since we have done one of these. But alhamdulillah, you know, better late than never. Uh, unfortunately, we're having a little bit of trouble with the video on your end, but that's okay. I wonder if you can hear me and see me quite clearly, inshallah. Yes, I can hear you uh, fine. And I can see there's a bit of issue with the uh, transmission as well from my side. Um, uh, tell me if it comes through. I'll try and put a static picture up there. That would make, might make it easier. Um, okay, but that's fine. That's fine, inshallah. Anyway, so how have you been through this uh, lockdown? I think you guys are in the UK. Yes, well, um, I have been busy and overwhelmed and i feel good about it uh, and i'm very thankful to allah because at this time so many of us have got the opposite problem we're not busy because there isn't work or businesses have struggled and my heart goes out to everyone who has been experiencing the negative sides of this lockdown uh, for people who are creative people who are in the professional field wherever people are struggling and i've yeah. got a lot to thank for keeping busy yes yes you know the main reason why we're speaking is because many people are struggling with their mental health and as you say mental wealth uh, many people are struggling and this lockdown the virus has not done any good uh, instead there is a lot of anxiety and a build-up of stress uh, uncertainty so much that everyone is going through so I know we've spoken already in the past but uh, one thing I wanted to introduce to all the viewers and perhaps to those who may or may not know, uh, you know, you've been so busy. It's an inspiration for someone like me, alhamdulillah. You've been so busy authoring some books and putting your, your thoughts and teachings on paper, on paper. So can you tell us more about your books, starting from the very first one, Basic Instincts? I recall that was last year this time if i'm not mistaken yes yes instant insights basic instincts eh? not far it talks about basic instincts um but okay. we are, instant insights was probably some point last year we um uh i think we got it out march or so and uh since then uh was a sort of a conversation that i was having because i then decided to go on uh social media and to interact with the readership to understand what they uh, would like. So Instant Insights was just, it had been brewing in my mind. You know, they say everybody has one book in them and I fully expected that this would be it and that would be over. But then... Well, actually, I, I, I want to, you know, I just want to highlight to the to the viewers out there and, and the listeners that uh, I'm so proud of you because it was my encouragement that actually made you go on to social media. A lot of the medical uh, fraternity, they might be working very hard, but not all of them would actually embrace social media. So I really want to appreciate that on behalf of everyone uh, who's benefited and those who will benefit, inshallah, from our brother, Dr. TK Harris. Well, uh, I think they have you to thank because uh, it was at your behest. In fact, you know, I, you know, as you know, we've had conversations over the years about 
how our respective fields interact and you know you yourself have a huge amount of sort of ability to deal with people's everyday issues uh, which could be said of me as well but from a professional sort of a different field and i always thought there was a conversation to be had between our fields because islam comes first as far as i'm concerned and what i guess what was always troubling me in my profession was there was the focus on the scientific but not the spiritual necessarily and i thought i think it's incomplete so i decided right i've got to do this because i need to benefit the ummah ultimately we are all on loan to earth from allah and we're going to return so let's not subhanallah you know let's not beat beat around the bush and let's say well, subhanallah subhanallah what, first, amazing 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 habibi so jumping straight into what we were saying the yeah. first book mashallah went very well you were probably expecting it to be just one and tell us how did the second the third and the fourth and everything happen thereafter because it's just amazing i've been going through your books i even did a forward for some of them and i'm just so impressed by how although you're not an islamic scholar but how you marry the islamic teachings with uh, your own field of medicine you know yes Well I think that, that again it was partly you know your inspiration and the fact that I you know I I feel privileged by Allah to have known people of your standard and standing um anyone in my position wants to understand Islam intellectually but to have a person like you in my life has allowed me to sort of go really do real deep dives and you know I've given you some very difficult questions in my view and you've sort of answered them very expertly and then i spent uh, probably 3 or 4 years reading deeply into all the sort of texts and hadiths and i began to form what were quite easy conclusions i must say i thought it would be difficult but actually the way islam i see islam as being static and unchanging and it's as if i imagine islam to be like a palace from which there is light coming out of the windows and science is just this machine which is heading happens to come across the light of islam from time to time and is doing so more frequently as time goes by from the very beginning you know when uh, we had scholars like ibn al haytham who discovered the the theory of light which i talk about then from the islamic revolutions the, the sort of intellectual age now it's our time because we are back you know subhanallah there are muslim scientists with covid vaccine and whatever who are high profile and i think it's time to grab that mantle and put my thoughts on paper so the first book was about just general principles of how the mind works and how to be you know how to find contentment with things like uh, you know the uh, tasawwuf al nafs how does that equate to a mental process scientifically can i isolate the nafs in the brain how to, and i found actually it was quite easy to make these connections it's so easy in fact but i realized that for other people they don't know you know what's going on in the brain so i sort of spelt that out and i go okay this is how anxiety works this is how relationships are conceived of and this is how the islam says it. and it it's it's actually proven true so the next book was then really from my social media following it was called instant actions because what i tended to get after that after your own sort of propelling me into that so public eye was a lot of questions from people saying look i'm having trouble with this this my relationship or i can't forgive people or i need to ask for forgiveness but i can't or i feel lost from my family so that book in a sense was if i took instant insights and said right okay that's the theory the practice is this so instant actions was entirely about saying okay these are a list of something like 40 different problems everyday issues you know losing your ability to smile always focusing on the past or the future or needing to be a, a bit closer to allah or needing to balance your work and your and your religion and i just you know to pause to, to to interrupt a little bit i must say that i have had hundreds of people come back to me and thank me to say shukran for introducing us to dr tk harris and his books they have helped us navigate through the mental challenges that we've had not just through covid and the lockdown and so much of anxiety but even otherwise so alhamdulillah i just want to say that so for the others who don't know the books are available on amazon there you can go to dr tk harris follow him on instagram uh, dr tk harris follow him on youtube he's got quite a few interesting uh, videos you know short and beautifully explained uh, different concepts now uh, what made you go into diet thereafter right so yes well what propelled me into it as again the conversation i'm having with the uh, uh, modest but very avid and keen following that i've developed you know 
Um, and they sort of, I sort of polled them a few months ago and said, you know, what would you like me to talk about? You know, this is what I do. I'm not an Islamic scholar, but I can bring the science to Islam um, and, you know, and, and diet or everyday issues amongst which diet was at the top. And I thought, well, okay, well, actually, this is very much a mental health issue because let's face it, most of the problems we have with controlling our food or our weight comes from how we perceive our food. And I can't control my eating or I control it too much because I think I'm too fat and now I've ended up being thin. Um, and okay, so, so I, I want to jump straight into this and tell you from an Islamic perspective, we're taught about halal food, about the halal slaughter, about uh, the ingredients, about certain things being prohibited about uh, how much we should eat, the quality and the quantity. Uh, that is what we're taught in Islam. Now, can you shed some light uh, on that from your perspective as a doctor? Indeed. Well, the, I examine these things very closely and it, it seems as if, like I said before, Islam is the palace to which science is advancing. So there are so many things which are if you like trending or being discovered today, you know, uh, the, the myths that we have about avoiding uh, um, uh, avoiding calories, about exercising and, and having low fats foods. And I thought, well, okay, hold on. What does Islam have to say about this? And there's none of this there. And in fact, if one examines the life of the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and what Islam says, halal, for example, let's talk about a couple of things which are sort of been there since the beginning. Halal, as you say, as you say in your videos and, and, and as any good scholar should know that halal is not just about how you kill the animal, how, what death it has, it's about what life it has. So in a sense, it isn't really halal if that creature has been treated badly, hasn't been, if the chicken hasn't been li living as a chicken, if the cow has been eating food, which is not really its natural food. So that sort of thing encompassed halal. And then we, we talk about things like low carbon footprint and, and, and sustainable agriculture. Well, you know, anyone who's a thinking Muslim would rightly know that we are loaned the earth and everything in it. And if we abuse those things, we are going to be accountable. So why did you damage this river? Why did you make these things knowing that you wouldn't be able to dispose of them? What? So I try to then conceive of this as how do we approach our food and what are we losing control of? And you know, something amazing that I was thinking about today I was speaking to my wife about something very interesting. I said, you know, we are driving here. And if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, obviously being the best of creation, the most loved unto Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, uh, he would have been uh, existing at a time when uh, technology was as advanced and even more advanced than it is right now. And he would have had the best of the best. So I'm quite sure that the simple life of the basics that he had was actually and is actually the best way of living. The simplicity, like now they have this minimalism, mm. they have mm. a lot of other things and even the organic food. I mean, he ate very simple food and it was, uh, I'm sure Allah Almighty would have ensured that he had the best of the best of the best. So uh, all this technology we have, yes, we're enjoying it and so on, but uh, from, from a, an enrichment perspective spiritually and uh, the fulfillment of your purpose in the dunya, I, I'd like to say that at the time of the Prophet ﷺ would have been the best time to have lived. I mean, as a, as a companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him uh, and so on. So uh, all this that crept up later, it's very challenging because to navigate through it in a way that is not displeasing to Allah on one hand and not harmful the other way. I love the verse of the Quran where Allah says that which is harmful is prohibited, which means anything you discover later on to be harmful in any way, consider it prohibited from me, subhanAllah. And anything that is beneficial, uh, you know, would be and pure, uh, anything pure, meaning with all the Islamic uh, restrictions mm -hmm. and beneficial would be permissible. So Alhamdulillah, it's just amazing, amazing. You know, the issue you've discussed in one of your books about halal on one hand and tayyib on the other hand, mm -hmm. that something could be technically halal, but it's not necessarily tayyib enough for us to, to, to want to go into and consume but for many reasons. So, so the, the, the books, just to, to, to clear it once again, because I see comments, people asking, where exactly are they available? Because I know they've been, they're very beneficial. Yeah, well, I mean, the stand, I think the best platform that I found was uh, to, to distribute or 
was Amazon. So you can go onto Amazon and just, if you find, search for Dr. TK Harris. Um, and then so you should find most of my sort of catalog, including my latest one. And if for those people who don't have Amazon, I've set up an Etsy outlet. So E-T-S-Y. And Etsy is a place which is pretty much global. I think it's owned by Google. And if you can't get the books on Amazon, you can find audio books and PDF downloads of all my books on Etsy as well, just because I'm conscious. I mean, my, mo my main mission is to just bring this message to as many people as possible. Inshallah, one day it will be for free once I can make this project self -sustaining. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. So I think, guys, let's give Dr. TK Harris a follow on YouTube as well and on Instagram, bi'ithnillah. Tell us, I cannot control my eating. That's what we've entitled this particular session. Tell mm -hmm. us more about it. What do you suggest? What should happen in a nutshell? Well, I think I, the conversations are, that led up to this question were things that we observe in our own lives. You know, we, 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 we think of Ramadan and even the non-Muslims in our lives, when they, when they hear you're fasting, we all get the same questions like, what, 30 days nonstop, not even water, this sort of thing. And we then go through Ramadan, and I believe that many of us have lost the essence of what Ramadan is. We're told, okay, look, you have to cut down on the food, and you, you fast technically from this point to this point. And what do we do outside? Although the alims would tell us, you know, eat modestly, we might do that, but many of us gain weight in Ramadan because we have this feast or famine approach. We, 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 we overeat and then, and then we starve and we get no benefit. And not to mention, we don't moderate ourselves in the other things that we, you know, did you know, for example, most Muslims don't know or may perhaps don't remember that you should speak less in Ramadan. You should be waving your arms around a lot less. Everything needs to be reduced because this is not, and it's not a boot camp where you suffer. The philosophy of Ramzan is not to impose suffering on yourself. It is actually the opposite. It's a sanctuary where you can go and it's like a very expensive spa break on, on Allah's expense. He's saying, look, cut out your life, relax, come to me and think about your life for a month. That's what I'm asking you to do. Cut down the food here because it will help to straighten out the way you look at food. It will be, make you more merciful. You will think about the poor, what they go through. And you will understand actually where you've been excessive in the rest of the year. And after Ramzan, if you use it in that way, it should be helpful. And beyond Ramzan, yes. you know, the, I, I, I'm sure, you know, you know so much more about this. But does that make sense to you, what I'm saying? Absolutely. And that's why the Prophet Sallam used to, uh, used to work his way into Ramadan with the fasting in the month prior to Ramadan, which is Sha'ban. And he also used to then work his way out of the month of Ramadan with a lot of fasting in the month of Shawwal, especially the six fasts that have been recommended for us. Now, uh, do you know this issue of intermittent fasting that has been promoted right now? I heard it on uh, several channels of non-Muslims saying they fast intermittently and they have uh, two fasts a week. They found it very beneficial. Uh, surprisingly, according to the Sunnah, Monday and Thursday, they also say Monday and Thursday. Like you rightly say, you know, Islam is like the, this light that is beaming and science is just getting from that light every now and again. Uh, and, you know, discovering that, whoa, it's there. They don't even mention the hadith or they may or may not know that it's the Prophet's teachings. But, uh, you know, I, I see that this intermittent fasting, fasting is not just a religious thing. Tell us about its benefits from a medical perspective. Indeed, indeed. Well, you know, uh, as a doctor, I must say, you, you don't necessarily, lots of doctors don't get trained in nutrition. So even many doctors would, would go along with the party line, what we've come to understand wrongly over the last 50 years that, you know, uh, a diet or controlling your food is all about cutting out the fats. It's about counting the calories. It's about doing more exercise. So things which were wholesome, things like fats and meats and, and, the, and the things that we enjoy eating were sort of lost and, and substituted with, uh, well, you know, sugar and carbohydrates and processing. And what you were saying earlier about the Prophet's simple life, you say, well, he ate this and he ate this food and he, was, he tended to eat one dish at a time and he would have butter and he would have meat. And, and so people have thought of, people kind of whitewash this going, oh, well, if he was around today, he would have probably eaten all the, what, what we've eaten. But actually, no, what do we see? We see things like paleo diet. We see keto diet. We see low carb diet. And actually what we've discovered is a lot of the information we had was misinformation um, based on either faulty studies 
or marketing by food companies or whoever. So intermittent fasting, I examined this issue because it, it struck a chord with me that, hold on, the sunnah is to fast twice a week. So the twice weekly fasting is probably the most popular of the sort of secular intermittent fasting. And within that, there's other little variants like 16 to 8 or 20 to 4, meaning 16 hours of the day yes. you, uh, you fast and, uh, sorry, you, you, you allow, yeah, you fast and eight hours when you're allowed to eat. Now it turns out when you examine the evidence very closely that fasting actually is far more effective in controlling weight and resetting your body system than any kind of dieting as such. And that's useful. So there's lots of books out there on intermittent fasting, which will basically need, will say to you, okay, fast, you know, twice a week or thrice a week or whatever. But then, you know, um, the, the, sorry the, to interject. I'm just thinking of the fasting being so beneficial for weight loss and so on. Yeah. Earlier, we were saying people gain weight in Ramadan. You know, primarily the, the, when we open the fast at the end of the day, it's not supposed to be a heavy meal. The Prophet ﷺ used to open his fast with al aswadan, sometimes with water, with dates, with something else. And there is never a record of him having had a, a big meal. Uh, it, when he broke his fast. And I think this is where a lot of us go wrong, where we have a massive meal trying to compensate for what we, in inverted commas, missed out on during the day. Yes, that's quite right. And in fact, a lot of the wisdoms that uh, are from that time uh, would, correct, would correct our misconceptions. So for example, you know, amongst what you've said, I looked very closely. What was the data on what the prophet actually ate? How often did he do this? And, you know, like you said, he had simple food. If there wasn't uh, dates around, he'd have some water, but he'd never ate excessively. And when he did eat a meal, it was simple, like sawik, which is like a roughened meal of barley and meat. So what does that tell us? And how does that relate to our modern uh, approach to uh, what we eat and what we don't eat? Well, there's some things which are just fascinatingly sort of just so revelatory, you will you will read them and go, oh, my God, I can't believe this. So there's a, you know, you, I think you've even said it in your, in your uh, lectures online and in the books that, you know, if you fast, you actually will get hungry a little bit. But the longer you fast, actually hunger goes away. Now, yes. you, might, you might say, people might say, well, actually, that's just, that's just mind numbing or brainwashing to, to make you feel all right about fasting. But the science turns out to be absolutely the case. What happens is you get a hormonal shift and the hunger that you feel initially from fasting is not a true hunger. There are three types of false hunger. Did you know that? There are three types of false hunger. There is wow. sugar hunger, there's emotional hunger. Oh God, you know, I'm, I, I, and I can't remember the third one right now because I've written, I'm a bit flummoxed, but there are three, three types of false hunger. And the true hunger is only that which comes after a long, actually, technically speaking, you can fast for much longer than the, the 12 hours or the 24 hours. But the prophet has made it easy for us. He was, he was asked once, you know, as you well know, he, he was to fast for three days, but he was asked by the Sahabi, can you, should we do this? And he said, no, Allah has made it easy for you. Only fast for the one day. This is what makes a fast for you. And within that one day, we'll see hormonal changes. And the wisdom of what, how the fast works is because you are tapping into a hormonal system which most of us today will not actually ever use unless we fast and unless we eat moderately. So the rules of Islam happen to be Islamic, but they are extremely scientific. I, they couldn't Allahu be Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You know, you've just inspired me to cut down further on my food and to <laughs> practice this, this two day fasting, you know, as it is, I, uh, subhanAllah, I've been quite conscious with what I eat. And, you know, I, I've also noticed you've written about the Prophet ﷺ uh, having divided his system into three and saying to us that if you're really going to eat and you really want to eat, then, you know, don't exceed a third for solid, a third for liquid and keep a third for air. So uh, can you speak on that a little bit? Because obviously, from an Islamic perspective, it's unquestionable. Uh, we will do it and we will do it because it's a sunnah. But it's always interesting to know the other benefits. Yes, well, this is especially useful. So people tradition, this is exactly what I'm saying. It ties into how I, I think we've been misinformed as to the ideas of hunger and fullness. Fullness 
it turns out. So if you are, for example, on a, a, a low fat diet, one of these modern ones where all your yogurts are 0% fat, and, but what they do is they fill it out with carbohydrates or with processed sugars and what have you. Did you know that actually, if you just eat that, you do not actually get true fullness. What you actually get is an insulin hit, which sedates you, and then you get hungry very soon afterwards. True fullness only really comes if you eat fats and proteins, because they result in a specific hormone being secreted, which then tells your brain that you are full. So you're already setting yourself up for problems if you're avoiding fats and proteins. And as for the stomach being wow. a third and a third and a third, there are stretch receptors in your stomach. So when you eat, when you eat fibrous and wholesome tayyib foods, and then, you know, the, I talk a, a lot about what tayyib actually means. There's five or six different qualities, be it wholesome, local, and what have you. What happens is you should not eat until you feel full because until you feel full in your, in, uh, in your head, because what that's doing is actually stretching your stomach beyond what is necessary for you to feel full. Eat slowly and eat until you feel reasonably full because when you eat the tayyib foods, proteins and fats and not the sort of refined carbohydrates, you, that fullness will hit you hard about an hour afterwards. And I thought, okay, is there evidence for this? There's plenty of data to suggest it. And when I've tried it myself, I, well, I am telling you this, I've tried this myself over the last year. It's a lockdown issue. I have never felt so full in my life, ironically, from eating less and filling my stomach up much more consciously. And, uh, so it, basically what you're saying is that you'd rather eat everything, but in moderation than to, uh, to take out things and to eat low fat stuff and so on. Well, I know when I was much younger, uh, maybe 15, 20 years back, I remember a discussion on our dining room table uh, once, our dining table, and uh, what was discussed is the harms of that which is low fat and that which is, uh, you know, uh, not natural. Mm. So from that time, I decided to have full fat milk and full fat everything and proper chocolates and proper uh, bread meat and proper everything, but, but I, you just minimize it, like you have less of it. So I, I feel extremely healthy. I feel that uh, alhamdulillah, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, health is from Allah and we thank him for it. But we play our bit. And I feel that, uh, you know, like you rightly say, whenever I have things with all these preservatives and, you know, long life something and something that's uh, low fat and low this and that, you actually don't feel as healthy as if you were to eat all of the stuff, but less. Yes, yes. In fact, that, that is it. And it goes further than that. Because we're just talking about the diet side. We've left out even the risk side. So the issue is this. Okay, so if you didn't fast, did you know if you do not fast and eat less, you are missing out on an important hormonal system which actually prevents cancer and actually encourages brain growth. Those systems only kick in after you have been fasting. So we get something called an autophagy. And autophagy is when your body realizes, okay, this guy is not eating. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch to a fat burning state. And when it switches to that fat burning state after about 16 hours or so, it then also kicks in a number of little factors which then go around sweeping up what we call rogue uh, genetic defects. So cells which are potentially cancerous and what have you. And also in the wow. brain, we get, we, get, we get release of BNFP, which is a sort of a brain growth factor. And those things only happen when you fast. Now, you know, it's you know, I have a friend, I, ha I have another friend who's a doctor who was telling me that in order to boost your immune system during this time of coronavirus, you should fast every Monday and Thursday. And him as a doctor was telling me this, and I, I didn't discuss it deeper with him, but I guess it goes back to what you're saying. So it actually boosts your immune system too. It, the immune system is exactly connected to, it's the same system that polices your body for cancer cells. And beyond that, let's, let's move it up a level to the true spiritual meaning. Did you know, for example, that you know, if you eat less, and specifically if you cut out the sugars or this what we call low index carbohydrates, which I explain in to some detail, I simplify it in the book, then what happens is for people who struggle with emotions, who have unstable emotions or anger, those evidentially, they become more calm. You get a more steady, even keel. So the biology influences the psychology when you actually change. So it's not just about 
weight loss. You know, all the books that we get secularly, what was, what was surprising, as you say, was there was no mention of Islam in those books. And yet the religion that does fasting more than any other one is Islam. And there was no mention in any of them about the, 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 the psychological approach to it, which actually in Islam is the main thing. It is. Subhanallah. You know, it reminds me of a cake that looks so beautiful from the outside, but inside it's actually, it's unacceptable. <laughs> so, you know, we, we have now uh, concentrated on our bodies. We want to look nice. You've got every, your abs and you've got everything else and you can stretch and you can, and you look so good, but inside you're so unhealthy. And, and, and this is when, when I see all these, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, big muscular guys, it's a good thing and it's a bad thing, depending on how you did it, you know. I'm not trying to say it's not good to be muscular and so on, but for me, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm happy with, uh, with, <laughs> with my little pack that I have. And I'm the yes. best, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I, <laughs> for as long as I'm healthy, I, I'm okay with the mu little muscle that I do have. I'm fine with, you know, I'm sure I can knock out a few of these guys here. Uh, <laughs> but, at the same, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, I think what's important and what, you, what you've highlighted here is something really, really important to be able to, con to, to, uh, to help the insides, your health, your organs, your body, your mind, uh, everything, you know, your immune system should be working correctly. And, and, and subhanAllah, the teachings of Islam of how to eat, when to eat, the sunnah practices, the encouraged practices of fasting twice a week, uh, the, three, the three fasts of the month, you know, those ayam al bil and so on. So I've just learned something new to say that it kicks in the... the a different, uh, you know, system altogether to be able to uh, check and mark and police and combat whatever needs combating. Yeah, it's a cleaning up process, which doesn't happen unless you fast. There is no, if you eat, you know, all these sort of advice on eating, eating little and often, is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a toxic process because it was thought to be less stressful to your diet, to be a grazer and what have you. Actually, no, Islam said, look, Respect the food psychologically. This is a provision of Allah. What are you doing? Why are you driving and eating? What's wrong with you? You know, sit down, appreciate, call the family around, make it an occasion and then eat slowly. Wow. Make the main purpose of your sitting down to eat. When you do that and you eat, actually you eat substantially, but twice a day or once a day, whatever it is, it actually then is in sync with what is naturally going on, what your body is naturally tending towards anyway and you will find there's weird stuff that happens Be believe me mufti there are some things which i cannot explain but there are kudrati cheese that you just think well allah made this this way for example if somebody ate now you the prophet ate at certain times he never ate too late he did that and, and i i examined all of these and it turns out if you and i supposing you and i ate exactly the same foods but i only ate them I ate my food very late at night, say 10 p.m. before I go to sleep. And you ate yours at, say, 8 or 6 p.m. I will actually gain more weight than you, even though I'm eating the same amount. How is that happening? And that happens because there's a hormonal system again, which actually, if you eat too late, what happens is it's your insulin levels stay up and it then turns as much of that food as possible into fat. Oh, so, so you've got to eat early, uh, meaning uh, the knockoff time should be a few hours before bedtime. Exactly, exactly. And, 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 uh, uh, and to eat as an occasion. Even the things like from the Prophet's life of what color plates he ate from. People now say, the psychologists say, you know, as far as I could find out, the Prophet ate from either wooden, steel or earthenware. And the earthenware tended to be uh, either green or red, not very often white. Why? And now you'll see because there's a psychological cueing system. If you, you mean, you mean I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to change all my white cutlery, <laughs> Habibi? <laughs> you may well do, because the evidence would suggest that actually those people who eat from colored plates feel more full compared to those who don't in a blind trial. So I'm, I'm going to have to try that blind trial too, <laughs> subhanAllah. <laughs> but these Habibi, are, this, is, yeah. this is very interesting because you know why I'm so intrigued and impressed is 
we we've known the sunnah all along and yeah. i've always wanted to know that you know from a, a from a perspective of someone who knows health and who knows the body and how nutrition works with the body and and is a muslim who can marry the two and here we have you and that's the reason why i i've chosen to you know to come on uh, instagram with you uh, it's not for the first time but again and again because i'm so intrigued and you know subhanallah what you said earlier also about about uh the amount of food and uh, food, uh, eating is an ibadah if it's the with the right intention so yeah. to concentrate to thank allah to to take your time so what you just said now is do not eat fast we have a problem even with some within my home uh, uh, sometimes we eat a little bit too quickly and i always say chew your food take your time chew your food take your time and the prophet sallam you know when we were small there was a myth the myth was that you know when you clean your entire plate the plate will make dua for you uh, that you cleaned it and, and and we religiously ate the last grain but actually the sunnah is you should be having all the grains you know whether the plate makes a dua or not is another matter yeah. <laughs> but the, you should be finishing your food don't waste and don't take too much eat from that which is near you and like you say make it an occasion Uh, sit with with your family and uh, concentrate on your food thank allah for it psychologically like what you're just saying now all that plays a role in getting the nutrition from that particular food and letting it be of the correct uh, benefit it's supposed to be for your body right absolutely i mean to get the right nutrition you know sometimes as i said before it, it keeps repeating this idea that you know we we sometimes make the mistake of thinking oh islam said this because it's just an islamic rule it's it's an ornament from times beyond but no everything repeats even the idea of say okay so it might seem for example let's take the idea of kindness to animals right so you might say okay well yes fine any religion would say kindness to animals islam says that with that animal will hold witness against you for how you treated it and if you know that it's been treated badly you will be asked to answer for it now what do we discover not only is it psychologically better but nutritionally it is better because if you were to compare the meat quality of a battery farmed animal versus the meat quality of a naturally farmed animal what what they have discovered actually and all the advice we get on red meat do you know the advice we've had on red meat avoid red meat it turned out that that those studies were conducted on battery fed animals and their fats are actually much higher in what we call uh, the sort of uh, heavier um full saturated fats so if you actually eat the meat from a grass fed organic uh, animal actually those fats will be the opposite they'll be good for you so it's not just the psychology it's the biology everything is contained within and i i can't stop spewing these facts because well it, it, it i have myself have enjoyed a journey of discovery over the last year especially in lockdown when i've been discovering these facts in the journals and what have you and every time i've compared them to the sunna i've said yes this is another paragraph i can put because this is something allahu I akbar did. allahu yeah. akbar and all those paragraphs you put together in these books and these books are all available Are we back inshallah? Ah. 
Are we yeah, I was saying you just released your book uh, yesterday or the day before, right? Yeah, it was yesterday. Yeah, I just uh, I was I'm releasing audio chapters uh, on my YouTube channel one by one, and I'm doing this at some risk for my publisher. Uh, but I've been reusing private links. I don't know how much longer that's going to last. But to people who want to, you know, my aim is to try to get it out for free if I could. And I thought, well, if I just release it privately, just link by link. But uh, I think now that the book is officially released, I'll be probably able to do that for a few more days, and then they'll they'll say, look. You've written the book. Do you want us to publish case or not? So take it off YouTube. I don't know, you know. But yes, yes. it was launched yesterday. No, inshallah. Uh, I'm just... But yeah, it's very beneficial. So you know, I recall from the time you mentioned the link of salah and the different postures of salah and how beneficial it is for the the uh, you know for the the individual and the human being and all the ibadah and then tharwatul qalb, the, you know, the, the series. I think you did more than one Tharwatul Qalb. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yes. So this um, the, the the series is the, the first one was uh, managing anxiety, uh, the volume one, and so Tharwatul Qalb volume two is Tayyib. and I will continue to make uh, the next series depending on the things that I've been asked to do by followers. So I've got things like uh, mental health issues in 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 relationships with people, depression. I've also considered things like addiction, um, finance. So these will be things, projects that I'm working on. And inshallah, also quite soon, I'll be launching an app, um, which will be all about sort of, you know, mental health management and trying to be the best person you can as a Muslim in this world. So um, inshallah, inshallah. And two have you know what? Well, subhanallah. May Allah make it easy, and I pray that you know volume two, three, and everything else comes up uh, uh, very, very successfully. And obviously, at this moment, we definitely need a lot of help with uh, all these things. We all want to be healthy. Immune system needs to be up. The mental uh, health condition needs to be uh, tip top, as I would say. As I would say. But at the same time, Habibi, you know, uh, what's very interesting is the. The, the, the diet and the fact that people try to lose weight and because of that they stop eating sometimes. I know of people who have anorexia or people who don't want to eat, they can't, they just stay away from eating completely and they get a phobia of food. You know, what would you say yeah. to them? I think, I think in your book you do have a chapter near the end that discusses this, right? Indeed, yeah. So I've, I've, I've added it to the appendix because it's not strictly part of the normal management of diet, but it does need to be mentioned because we're talking about weight control. So weight control, for most people, it's about trying to keep your weight down. But for some people, it can go to the extreme where their weight is uh, severely underweight. And uh, from the mental health point of view, this is a, these are very, very serious conditions. They are actually much more lethal than many physical conditions. You know, things like anorexia and bulimia can have up to a 20% mortality rate. One in five people will not survive these conditions. So we're not messing around here. And they have their origins in a number of different uh, causes, if you like. And a lot of it in, in many people with anorexia is to do with the idea of finding something that they can control as a substitute for the things that they cannot control. So if some people have been through traumas, for example, or they have lived in families where they've been mistreated, uh, where expectations are high, if for things that they cannot satisfy, it's an idea that, especially in younger children, you know, the, in, in, in younger children or in adolescents, the nafs is very strong and they haven't quite developed their qalb, their intellect. So what happens is nafs defends you and the nafs says, okay, I can't control these things outside my life, but what I'm going to control is what I can control. I can control what I eat. And so they focus on that because it seems to have some kind of undoing of all the stuff that is very difficult in their life otherwise. So it may not even be about the food, but it is something that they can exhibit and feel better about. In the same way, I guess, at the other extreme, we talk about comfort eating. And comfort eating is about, I can't control these unmanageable emotions or this difficult issue in my life. What I can control is I can get a little bit of pleasure from eating and from re and comfort eating quite deliberately tends to be high carbohydrate. Why? Because we are 
short circuiting the nafs. We are short circuiting the system that sedates us. You know, when you eat sugary food and when you eat a lot of rice, for example, on Eid day, that that sedation you get afterwards is part of a reward system. So when we talk about people who eat too much, mostly the problem is not to do with the the, the food as such; it's to do with the food having an effect on. the reward system and it's the same system at work which you'll see in addicts of various other kinds be it you know at the worst end things like heroin but smartphone addiction and and what have you have the same system in mind so we are trying to reclaim with the idea of tayyib as it how can we reclaim the idea of food being a source of pleasure only it is a provision of allah and believe it or not there are ways in the book that i've described that you can actually continue to eat a cake and i you know i've had a sweet tooth since as long as i can remember and unlike yourself you've always been in fantastic conditions but unlike you i my weight has yo-yoed but now for the first time i am able to look and eat a packet of sweets and not feel one little iota of guilt because Whoa. i know exactly Whoa. how to man- right <laughs> it's just a wonderful feeling to have Uh, so when you I say just, I know how to manage it I I can you can you tell us what that is Well yes well what I've done essentially is first you have to consider well what is the food that I can eat and what I can't eat or what I shouldn't eat and like you say it might be technically halal to eat a packet of sweets every day but that doesn't mean it's good for you it's not tayyib right so cut out the refre- uh, so go without for a while and let your body reset do some uh, some 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 fasting so that you allow this hormonal system and learn what i also give is mental lessons on how to recognize true hunger as opposed to emotional hunger and how to recognize that actually i'm eating now because i feel anxious or i have an urge to eat because i've actually i ate some carbohydrates earlier and at the moment i'm hungry not because i'm truly hungry but because my insulin has just is it's at it it's 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 way high and my sugar is way low when you get that under control then you can relapse i still have a sweet tooth and there are still times when i you know i gravitate towards the fridge and i'm opening it and and my mom has put some lovely things there my wife has put some cake there but now there are ways i i can do with for example i would have and i suggest this you have the agreement not to de- not to uh, deny yourself but delay it so there may be one or two days a week when i say actually wednesday and saturday will be the days i can eat these treats so i will say okay i won't have it today because wednesday is when i'm going to eat more that's one tra- strategy so then the nafs feels happy because there's nothing worse for your for your nafs than to be told no you know tell a child no they'll actually they'll rebel they say no but if you tell a child okay no problem <laughs> tomorrow then they'll okay. they'll go along with that right that's one yeah thing. yeah Uh, and actually and to uh, there's a, a thing about being kind to yourself you know allah says be kind to others but people forget your own dialogue within yourself is actually quite cruel you say ah i ate sweets ah oh, i feel so bad i shouldn't have done it what an idiot now imagine you'd said that to someone else that's not a nice so if you eat something and you've relapsed you've not intended to eat it actually reverse it go Well actually I enjoyed it it was a provision of Allah it was lovely to eat and I refuse to feel guilt at something that is a provision of Allah even though it might not be good for me what that does is give you the control back it means next time you eat it you eat it slowly and you actually realize this stuff is mega 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 sweet i don't want to eat so much of it and you won't have that rebound guilt because you'll eat less you just think actually i've had enough I don't have my emotions determine. I'm eating this for pleasure, not for alleviation of anxiety. Does that give you a clue? That is is that helpful? So so basically what you're saying, I mean what I've understood is initially it comes for alleviation of something, it's more of an addiction and when you manage to control yourself and uh you know hold back and just give a, a day or two where you you're going to call it like a cheat day for example then you begin to realize that this is just a pleasure uh, you know it's just to eat something i like rather than uh, i'm craving for this and and i need it and, and and it has to be there absolutely and in fact i took my cue from the prophet's book because you know again the secular books will call these cheat days and whatever but actually i don't call them that i call them simple parts of your life because the prophet was known to enjoy dates and honey he didn't eat them very often right but he, this is what this is the kind of well he ate dates and dates i talk a lot about dates and how if the prophet was around today 
what would the prophet say to us? Yes, he'd say, eat dates in moderation. And did you know, for example, he, he, he did things which were far in advance of their time. For example, when he ate dates, he generally ate them with, um, I can't remember, the, well, they, they're called pickled zucchinis or gherkins um, because that cut up the tartness and increased the fiber. And that's the exact, exact advice you get from a diabetologist. If you eat something sweet, use it, eat it with something tart and something fibrous because that reduces the sugar load. There's our prophet was there time, time and time ago. Going, SubhanAllah. Subhanallah. So it's these you know, kind of the, the, the sad thing is that a lot of the modern minds think that, oh, that's Islam. You know, it's just the Prophet ﷺ. It's just a long yeah. time back. It's just like, you know, ancient Arabia. It's a setting that was not the setting. And as much as we believe in the Salah and, and the Zakah and the pillars of Islam, but, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, his ways are not necessarily compulsory. Some people say that, you know, without realizing yeah. that, the, the benefit of following the entire sunnah as best as we can actually is way beyond our imagination. Subhanallah, Rabbil Alameen. And that's why I love talking to you, Habibi. And you know, time flies, mashallah. We've already spoken for more than 45 minutes. And alhamdulillah, I pray that Allah, Allah grant you goodness. And I'd like to see you back, inshallah, again on one of our lives here. So many comments. I'm reading a lot of them here. And there's some amazing stuff. Inshallah, I'm going to try and get this posted on YouTube. Perhaps you can do too. Uh, guys, yeah, Dr. TK Harris, follow him on YouTube, follow him on Instagram. And inshallah, you will be able to benefit quite a lot uh, regarding the Islamic aspects of a lot of concepts and things uh, connected to mental health, mental wealth, connected to your diets, and so much more uh, that inshallah we will learn. So Jazakallah Khair Habibi, any parting words? Oh, Jazakallah khair. I just thank Allah that there are people, you know, so many people are thankful that we have uh, people like you and I'm always thankful. And just to say to your audience who are listening, you know, people have a persona in public and you think, oh, it'll be, it might be different when he's on a private level. Believe me, this man is even more magical mm. on a one-to-one -one basis. May Allah public. forgive us. May Allah forgive us. That, that, that's your kindness and may Allah make us even better uh, in, in person than we are perhaps online. Uh, and oh, may Allah are, keep it are. that way. You are indeed that Barakallah. way. Barakallah. Thank Allah. Habibi, thank Habibi. Allah. May Allah bless you and shukran for your kind words. And uh, jazakumullah khair for everyone. And uh, we hope to meet again. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam.